gentle listener, and welcome to Nocturnal Transmissions, the fortnightly podcast that brings you dark tales, both old and new, performed by voice artist Kristen Holland. This episode, we're celebrating our dear friend Ian Sputnik's newly released book, Food for Worms. What he describes as an anthology of small, dark bites of life, death, and everything in between, and beyond. You will, of course, remember Mr. Sputnik from his stories Meal Deal and Eyes which we featured in episodes 3 and 8, respectively. It's been far too long since we last enjoyed any of the offspring of Mr. Sputnik's fecund imagination. Let's make up for that shortfall by doing something we've never done before, gentle listener. We're going to give you a twofer. Yes, gentle listener, two stories in one episode. What a treat. Nocturnal Transmissions is proud to present our first story of episode 69, New Tricks, by our favorite diamond geezer, Ian Sputnik. Colin dragged himself from his bed. He felt tired, as usual. Once he put his dressing gown on with effort, he slowly worked his way down the stairs. He was greeted by the silly, waggy-tailed man's best friend that was Dolly. Man's best friend. What a laugh. This was Deb's dog. Deb's being his wife. She had to go into work early that morning, yet again. Someone's got to put the bread on the table, she had explained. The dog was ever-present, though. Not working, he had inherited the burden of looking after the little beast most days. The white and grey chihuahua wagged its tail until it looked like it would knock itself off its feet. Stupid thing, he thought to himself. You want breakfast, then? After feeding her, he made his way into the ground-floor bathroom. Yep, I look like crap. Wash time, I think. He ran the bath, then tested the temperature with his hand. It was a bit too hot for his liking, so he decided to have a cigarette and let the water cool for a while, rather than adding cold water and then trying to circulate it to get an even temperature at both ends of the bath. That method never seemed to work. Dolly began to run around his feet in a fit of unwarranted excitement and affection. Colin then went to the front door to retrieve the mail from his postbox. Nothing but bills and junk, but he played out the same routine every day, nonetheless. Outside, the yobs from next door were larking about and swearing at the top of their voices. Scum, he muttered to himself. He could remember when this was a good neighbourhood, populated by respectable people who worked hard for a living. Not this new breed the sort who lived off welfare, the kind who brought their kids up with the same morals, or lack of them, as them. A generation of degenerates who would have no more ambition in life than waiting for the next government check. Said remuneration would pop through their letterbox with the regularity of a normal pay packet. What was worse, they got housed in a property identical to his, a house that he had worked all his life to pay for. Now, working people would have to pay tax just so they would get the same housing for nothing, with the added inconvenience of them living next door. After dumping the mail into the bin, he retreated to the bathroom, the water being a little bit cooler by then. He eased himself in, cooing gently to himself. Laying there, all his problems seemed to momentarily drift away. The loneliness of being at home without his wife didn't seem to weigh as heavily on his heart. He decided he would just relax for a while, forget everything and start the day afresh. 
he saw the unmistakable little white tip of Dolly's tail from over the lip of the bath as she waddled past. He heard the lapping of her tongue as she nestled into his hand and licked at it. His useless arm hung outside the tub. She was always licking him. Sometimes he enjoyed the sign of affection. Mostly it was just a bloody annoyance. After a few minutes, he saw her tail disappear out of the door as she retreated back to the living room. This gave him more time to think. He would sort out his neighbours. No way in hell would he live next door to that... trash. On top of all that bullshit, the government had invited him to a review of his current situation. Trying to cut my benefits, he thought. How bloody dare they! He'd show them. A full life of working and paying into the system while those layabouts just sponged off it and now probably received more money than him. Well, fuck that! It just wasn't right! Colin heard Dolly come tip-tapping back into the bathroom and dutifully start to lap once again at his hand. Then the tap-tap bloody tapping as it scampered back into the living room. Just make your bleeding mind up, you useless mutt he thought. Things are going to change around here, he decided. Then he said it out loud, just for effect, half hoping his neighbours would hear him. This made him feel a bit better. What was this country coming to? Wasters living off the back of this country, layabouts raking in government handouts, baby factory girls enjoying the high life, popping out kids left, right and centre. None of this was fair. It wasn't his fault he now had to draw benefits. He had suffered a stroke five years earlier. This had left one side of his body completely numb. He needed a stick to walk, and so was not a very attractive prospect for any potential employer. He couldn't believe that it was him that the government wanted to financially penalise. No way, Jose, was that going to happen. Not on his watch. He might be down, but he wasn't out. They'd see just how much fight he had left in him. He started feeling tired. Stop getting yourself so worked up, he said to himself. Just bloody relax. He sank further into the bath. In his head, he started to formulate a plan... He would strike back at the bureaucrats, those idiots that were in charge, the self-appointed pricks who thought themselves so above everyone else. He had worked hard for his home, and damned if anyone would try and force him out of it. He wasn't going to downsize just to make ends meet. As for the parasites living next door, well, he had plans for them, too. Dolly was breaking his concentration. She kept insisting on running in and out of the bathroom. He thought about yelling at her to settle down, but was too intent on plotting his campaign against his neighbours and the bureaucrats. Also, he couldn't be bothered to use up any energy on her. At that moment, even raising his voice seemed too much effort. The morons next door were usually out for a few hours each day. This would give him time to sneak round and leave a nasty surprise for them. He could get in easily. The flimsy back door and inadequate locks on their property would make a child's play. Maybe cut the gas line to their cooker and wait for them to get home and flick the light switch on. The spark would be enough. No, that would never work. Well, it might, but he'd probably blow up his own house as well. As for sneaking, hobbling would probably be a more accurate assessment of his capabilities. He slipped even further into the water. It edged its way up his face. He was so tired. So very tired. Everything was getting on top of him lately. The colour had begun to drain from his face. And as his mouth and nose submerged, he didn't even have the energy to lift his head up above the waterline again. Dolly came trotting back into the bathroom. She paused briefly before 
tentatively walking through the large puddle of blood that had begun to pool around the edge of the bathtub and looking for another tasty treat. There was only one finger left on the bloody stump of her owner's hand. The bones were really difficult for her to bite off. She had managed, eventually, having had to chew through the flesh and muscle first. She licked her lips and set about gnawing on the little digit that remained. This one could be taken more easily. Then she would take it back to her dog basket to add it to the collection. She would finish stripping the flesh off of these later. She loved these new delicacies, especially the one with the shiny golden metal thing on it. And as she hadn't been shouted at, she knew she wasn't being bad. She was enjoying this new game, and deservedly so. Dolly was a good girl. New Tricks by Ian Sputnik You know, Dolly is actually a real dog. I understand her owners challenged Mr. Sputnik to write a horror story that featured their roly-poly little chihuahua, believing they had set him an impossible task. Not so, it would seem, gentle listener. Not so. Our second featured story from Mr. Sputnik's inaugural collection is a bite-sized morsel of dark matter entitled Dead Air. The doorbell rang. Here we go again, I thought. My sister answered. An elderly woman was welcomed in and led to the living room. We took our places around the table that stood in the centre of the room. The clairvoyant sat with her back to the door. My sister Claire took her place opposite her. I sat opposite my wife, Helen, as the circus began. Before we start, if we can just get the payment of fifty dollars out of the way, the old crone said. Of course, my wife replied. She passed an envelope over. The woman swiftly took it and inspected the contents before stuffing it into her pocket. Let us begin. We are here to attempt to reach those loved ones that no longer dwell amongst us. So the pathetic ritual started. This crook went through the whole act, moaning, wailing, speaking in tongues. It was all I could do to contain myself and not burst out laughing. I kept silent, though. My wife seemed to live off these pathetic pantomimes. What sort of husband would I be if I took this away from her? I switched off as the hag asked the usual questions. My wife answered each in hushed tones. After about half an hour of screeching and groaning, all fell silent. I'm sorry, the old woman apologized. The spirits don't wish to let themselves be known to us on this occasion. What a bloody surprise! What a rip-off merchant! Fleecing money off people left, right and centre! She rose, packed away her trinkets and made her way to the hallway, closely followed by my wife and Claire. I remained seated at the table, biting my lip, trying to hold my anger in. So, Helen, the lady inquired, how long has it been since your husband passed? They continued talking as they entered the hallway and made their way towards the front door. Claire switched the living room light off and shut the door behind them, leaving me sitting alone in the dark. Dead Air by Ian Sputnik from his recently published collection Food for Worms available through Amazon.com 
If you would like to find out more about this author, please visit our website, nocturnaltransmissions.com.au. Now, I wonder if any of you followed up on our recommendation last episode. For those Cavalier listeners who don't bother listening through to the end of our episodes, you'll be missing out on our Nocturnal Transmissions Recommends section going forward. The brief moment at the end of each installment where we recommend something of a dark nature that we have been enjoying here at Nocturnal Transmissions. A pleasure shared is a pleasure double after all. We'll be getting to our latest recommendation in a moment, but first we have some good news for those of you who've been enjoying the A Voice from Darkness podcast. It has returned. Episode 6, Broken Mirror, is now available through all reputable podcast providers. A Voice from Darkness, written by Jack Rees and starring our own humble narrator, Kristen Holland, as Dr. Malcolm Ryder. You'll find a link on our website. Now, it's time for another installment of Nocturnal Transmissions Recommend. Nicholas Cage, certainly one of America's most unpredictable actors, is currently starring in a feature film adaptation of H.P. Lovecraft's The Color Out of Space. This, however, is not our recommendation on this occasion. Oh yes, we've seen it, it's just not our recommendation. What we are recommending to you, gentle listener, is a lesser-known film which he produced in the year 2000. Shadow of the Vampire. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with F.W. Murnau's 1922 masterpiece, Nosferatu, A Symphony of Horror. Starring the unforgettable Max Schreck as Count Orlok. Well, Dracula, but they didn't have the rights, that's a whole other story. Well, gentle listener, so compelling, so authentic, so chilling was Max Schreck's performance as the titular vampire, that rumours abounded at the time that director Franz Murnau had in fact found a real vampire, and that the poor actress Greta Schroeder, who comes to a sticky end in the film's later stages, oh spoilers, was in fact the victim of the world's first snuff film, as it were. Shadow of the Vampire is the story of how this all may have played out if the rumours were in fact true. They weren't, by the way, gentle listener. Greta Schroeder's continuing film career attests to that. Not that pesky little facts like this have ever put off a good conspiracy theorist. Heavens no, that's why Buzz Aldrin has to keep punching people. Anyway, if you're a lover of classic horror cinema, or just cinema in general, and the magic of movie making, please watch this film. Oh, did I mention that John Malkovich plays F.W. Murnau, and Willem Dafoe plays the vampire? <laughs> Nuff said, gentle listener. Nuff said. Shadow of the Vampire. Nocturnal Transmissions. Recommends it. This episode was brought to you with the generous assistance of our cohorts. Sam Bell, Robert Troy Hampton Peterson, Evan Dooley, Michael Wood, and Sanitarium Magazine. All non-public domain stories are featured with the permission of the authors. All voices and production are concocted by Kristen Holland. Until next time, 
as always. Watch the skies, fear the dark, and don't trust anyone. Especially yourself. Good night, gentle listener.